Uh, thank you very much, Program Director. Um, I will start by saying all protocol observed, and then I will just mention, if, if I don't mention you, please, I've mentioned you already. All protocol observed. Um, but I would like to just acknowledge the speaker of the House of Federation of the Federal Republic of Ethiopia, because uh, we are in Ethiopia, and uh, thanks for being here. And of course, the EU Commissioner, uh, I would also like to welcome the UNESCO Secretary General, the UNECA, uh, our brother Carlos, we, live, we all live here. And we, of course, have to acknowledge very fondly uh, the founder of uh, WIP and former Vice President of the EU Parliament, our sister Silvana. Uh, and I'd like to also welcome all my sisters, starting with uh, Madame Bangura there, Madame Puri, Madame uh, from, the, from Sweden, Mary Kivyemnini, I think I, I haven't spelled it, I haven't pronounced it correctly, but, um, and then I would want a special welcome of our former president of Malawi, our sister Joyce Banda. And of course, welcome to all the members of international organizations who are here. Welcome to members of the Diplomatic Corps and members of the PRC, but most importantly, welcome to members of parliament who have come from across the world to be here. It is a great honor for me to welcome you to the headquarters of the African Union and to wish you a fruitful stay in this hospitable city of Addis Ababa. The theme of the summit is, is an interesting one, but a very difficult one as well, because the new leadership for global challenges, I hope we come back to that uh, later. But honorable members, during the first women uh, in Parliament Global Summit in Brussels 2013, we celebrated 120 years of since New Zealand women won the right to vote, the first in the world. It made me wonder, how long did it take for the first women to enter Parliament in the world? So I did a bit of research, and I found that even though New Zealand won their first right to vote, it was only in 1893, it, in, in 1893, it was only in 1919 that they were allowed to stand for elections. So first, they were given the right to vote, but not the right to stand for elections. And then years later, and it, it was only in 1933 that the first MP, Elizabeth Macomb, was elected to the New Zealand Parliament. You see how long it took? 1893 to 1933. But of course, the first women MPs came from Finland, uh, which they got their franchise in 1906, and they were elected, uh, two of them were elected the following year. But the same story uh, across the world uh, repeats itself. But I just, I just thought we should share that. Now let's come back to 2015. And this gathering of women MPs representing 9,923 women MPs from all parts of the world, it shows that things haven't really changed because though we are more than 50% of the population, but we are a very small portion of parliamentarians across the world. 
there is now general agreement that we need to, as a start, a critical mass of women in parliament of at least 30 percent to begin the shift towards gender parity. So I'll take stock of Africa. Uh, we are still lagging behind. I will just mention those countries that have 30 percent of female MPs. I will start with Rwanda, Namibia, Seychelles, Senegal, South Africa, Mozambique, Angola, Tanzania, Uganda, Algeria, Zimbabwe, Tunisia, Cameroon, and Burundi. Those are the only ones that have reached the We are looking forward to the 2015 elections in Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Togo, Benin, Burundi, Egypt, and Sudan. And we hope they'll be able to reach the 30% threshold in, the, in those elections. But globally, I don't think we're doing any better, but the struggle continues. The struggle for representation in government, in the judiciary, in fact, in all spheres of private sector, in the private sector, and all spheres of human endeavor, women should be represented. Africa this year is celebrating the year of women empowerment and development. And with the rest of the world, looking at the historic Beijing conference which took 20 years back, our choice to focus on women in 2015 is part of the ongoing struggle for gender equality in our continent. At the beginning of 2015 in January, the African Union Summit adopted the collective African vision for the next 20 for the next 50 years to move the continent in the shortest possible time towards a prosperous, people-centered, integrated, peaceful continent and a dynamic force in the world. But of course, the theme is leadership, but leadership needs to have a vision. So this is the collective vision of Africa, and we call it Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. I will highlight a few of, of the aspects of that Agenda 2063. And it's premised primarily on investing in Africa's most precious resource, which is its people. It is for this reason that we emphasize access to health for all, girls and boys education, and African skills revolution that will see more of our young people and women focusing on science, technology, engineering, and maths, and also research and innovation. This is both to develop their talent so that they can reach their full potential, but also for them to be drivers for Africa's development towards shared prosperity. Agenda 2063 also emphasizes the development of infrastructure, Rail, road, aviation, maritime, energy, ICT, water, sanitation, and social infrastructure, as well as the need to transform African agriculture and agro businesses and to beneficiate and add value to our natural resources. This means a deliberate plan to banish the whole to the museum and modernize and mechanize agriculture. We, have, we are starting a campaign to replace the whole with tillers and tractors were appropriate in the next 10 years. So it, after 10 years, we really don't want to see the whole except in the Agricultural Museum. That's our campaign, and anyone who wants to join this campaign is welcome. <laughs> Agenda 23 is also ensuring that we benefit, we benefit from our vast oceanic spaces and the resources it holds by developing our blue economy. As we gather here today, the first ever conference of African women in maritime is taking place in Luanda, Angola, where women in this sector will discuss how they will cooperate to make inroads into shipping and maritime transport, into fishing, offshore oil, and other aspects of the blue economy.
I should have been in that conference, but I'm here. Uh, but I'm well represented there as well. Agenda 2063 also prioritizes democracy, human rights, gender equality, the empowerment of women and young people, management of diversity as critical to good governance, the eradication of poverty, ending gender-based violence, and the building of tolerant, caring, stable, inclusive, and peaceful societies. Honorable members, we know that these aspirations outlined above will happen faster and be more sustained through the empowerment of women and girls. This is why it is so important to ensure that in all our countries we reach the critical mass of women in parliament and government. In addition, we must also share experiences as members of parliament on how we take the gender agenda forward in the work that we do every day. During the African Year of Women, we prioritize financial inclusion, and the ADB, our sister there, General Geraldine, is working on this matter with others. Economic empowerment, access to modern technology inputs, access to capital, to land and markets, and expanding opportunities to education and training to girls and women. In addition, we are advocating the right of women to be represented in everything. But we must also ensure that other issues critical to women are the center, are at the center of the post-2015 development agenda and to the sustainable development goals. Honorable members, I've spoken about some of the issues that concern the African continent. But there are global concerns and issues, hence the relevance of the theme of this summit, new leadership for global challenges. These universal challenges of increasing women's access to economic resources, their participation in public life, and of ensuring human security, peace, and sustainable environment are matters that concern women everywhere, not only in Africa. It is true that we need leadership that can deal with these challenges decisively. I believe that we need leadership that puts people at the center of everything, that listens and understands the needs of the people, and that is compassionate and empathizes with its people. We need a leadership that serves as role model and that inspires young people in particular, but the population in general to want to reach greater heights. We need leadership that knows how to manage diversity by respecting every race, gender, culture, religion, language, and supports tolerance. It must be a leadership that embraces diversity as a strength rather than a threat. If not, we, sh we shall encourage exclusion, and exclusion breeds extremism. We need leadership that understands Newton's third law of physics, that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Or the maxim, do unto others as you want to do them do unto you. So we also need leadership that understands that good leaders are as good as their teams. That encourages teamwork and empowers those around them. We need leaders that shine the light for others, but is ready to receive the light from others. The leadership we need must be honest, transparent, and ready to acknowledge mistakes. Understanding that, I will quote from a young female poet, that every beautiful rock has its fault lines. So there's no one perfect, 
but if we all work together, we can complement uh, anybody's mistake. But a leader who thinks they are perfect and they know everything and they don't listen, we don't need for the challenges we're facing. But we also need leaders who are flexible, who change when they see that there is a need for change. And of course, as Einstein said, we need leaders who will not do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. When you see something doesn't work, try something else. And of course, as we grow our economies, we need to put people at the center, not only profit. Profit is, is necessary, but it can't be only profit. It must be people at the center. Of course, we also need leaders who understand that this planet should be bequeathed to future generations and it should still be pleasant for future generations to live in. And of course, we need leaders who work to ensure that they bequeath future generations with a better world that they found. And of course, as I describe all this, in my view, this leadership must include women. It, it cannot exclude women. Of course, we need leaders of strong character. And we know that strong character is not built overnight and is not congenital. It is forged on the anvil of experience, self-discipline, dedication, and integrity, and many other uh, qualities that I have not mentioned. As women leaders, this should be the type of global leadership we want to be part of and we strive to build. This is a global leadership for a more humane and caring world. I wish this summit fruitful deliberations and I look forward again to the vibrant discussions. I thank you.